And hi, hello everyone. Uh, so it's my pleasure today to talk about FPGA prototyping. And then, uh, as I said, it should be mentioned quite a couple of times throughout the presentation today. Um, yeah, um, FPGA prototyping platform is important uh, both for verification and also more importantly for software development and, uh, and testing. So my topic today is talk to talk about the over uh, the challenges of FPGA based prototyping. But actually, we organized the presentation a little bit to put uh, to real to put into five simple points that I hope that uh, uh, you can take away uh, to uh, to to hopefully that uh, can change maybe how maybe you can build your next FPGA prototyping platform. So I'm going to start with my first point. Uh, so my so my my first uh, takeaway point is that uh, so what is the most important factor? of selecting a FPGA prototyping platform. Um, there may be many different answers, and my personal opinion is scalability. And then the reason is very simple, because our design today uh, grow uh, rapidly, uh, both because of um, integration of more, more and more function into the chip, and also we need to talk, the chip needs to talk to uh, multiple uh, standards, multiple uh, support multiple OS, and so on. So um, the design, uh, grow rapidly, not only just grow rapidly, it needs to interface with all different types of stuff. So uh, ideally, uh, if you want to use FPGA prototyping platform, it needs to also be able to scale just like your, uh, your design scales. Uh, so what do I mean by scale here? As you can see on, on, on the chart, um, when, you, when your design grow, you need to be able to add more FPGA, more, more logic gates. When you need to more, add more memories, uh, either it can be DDR, DDR2, uh, DDR3, or SRAM, or, and, and so on. We need to be able to have the, the ability to add different memories. And also subsystems. Uh, many times your, 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 your design today may be using USB 2.0 and 3.0 tomorrow, and, P, and different PCIe or MIP and, 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 and so on. And then having the ability to add different subsystems or change the subsystems is very, very important. So um, yeah, having said that, scalability sounds very simple and very straightforward. But um, actually, there's a lot of uh, know-how in uh, selecting a scal real, real scalable system. Uh, for example, there are systems that are definitely not scalable. There are plenty of, um, everyone probably you know, there are plenty of APGA prototyping boards out there. There can be very, very cheap boards from uh, Xilinx Altera websites to expensive systems. Uh, but how do we know which one are, are um, really scalable, easily scalable for your applications or for, or for for or for your company? So I can give some examples. For example, uh, there are there are boards that plug into PCI, PCIe form factors. They are usually not scalable for for many reasons. If you want to add in more logics later, it's very hard to scale. You want to add in more uh, different IOs to to test the system is not very scalable. And there are, there are also other people try to put all different type of uh, all all the um, IOs, all the interfaces they need on the APGA board itself. Um, yeah, that may be good for one specific uh, application. But what if your design changed and that then that, that board becomes unusable? So that's also not scalable. So definitely. So uh, talking about scalable, of course, we need uh, some kind of an open platform uh, that's easy that uh, have uh, standard connectors that can easily uh, change to different. Uh, uh, interface cards and add different memories and so on, but not but not but not just only that. When you think about uh, putting multiple boards together, how do you make sure they they work together? Uh, definitely, you need some kind of tools to make to test those uh, multiple APGs coming together. How do you test them? Performance, for example, how do you make sure when you have multiple boards together, you you are still running a high performance reliably? How about clocks? Uh, do you do you think about um, not just putting two boards together, stacking together, and think that's a scalable system? Uh, the clocks might not work, might, might not work as 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 your ASIC. You you might have internal ger generated clocks that you need to fix and things like that. So there are actually a lot of tricks into considering a scalable system. So I think that's my first point. It's very important to have a, a truly scalable system, and there are a lot of considerations considerations into actually picking a scalable system. Okay, so my second point is maybe a little bit more controversial, which is uh, partitioning. Uh, many people, uh, when they think about prototyping, they say, oh, 
partitioning is a uh, is maybe a nightmare. And then I actually going to to say different thing today. I'm I'm just going to say that partitioning today is not as bad as you you thought, or it's actually easier than you think. And there are three simple reasons I'm going I'm going to talk about here. First of first of all itself is that APGA has become much bigger nowadays. And although your your our design grow also very big, but our uh, IP blocks they don't grow as as fast as the uh, FPGA. So most of your design block today are actually, as you can see, they fit into uh, FPGA. You are actually uh, trying to figure out which IP block and which IP goes together into FPGA instead of traditionally we are trying to uh, find out how to cut through this IP uh, or, or those design blocks and trying to. Uh, mess around with gates, clocks, and things like that. Most of the time, you'll be able to uh, get a very clean, clean cut. And then, and today, there are technology. There, there are very easy flows. You can use hierarchical block-based uh, partitioning uh, methods, so that you actually don't take a lot of time. You can uh, black box a lot of those heavy, uh, heavy-duty IP blocks. Treat them as black box. And when you do partitioning, it's actually not as bad. So that's the first point. And then the second point, of course, is once you get the uh, the design into the um, the APGA, then the next question is of uh, placing to the APGA. The next question is interconnect, and everyone knows that APGA has limited number of of pins, uh, so uh, we need uh, some kind of uh, methods to transmit much more number of IOs in, in between uh, in between uh, the uh, the APGAs uh, with the partition design. So of course the method is using uh, pin multiplexing or time domain time domain multiplexing TDN, and traditionally the only method is using TDN based on single ended signals. And, and as, as as many of of, of of us know, using single ended signals we can usually run at about 150 to 200 megahertz on on the FPGA, and with so many signals running at the same time, it becomes a signal integrity issues. And when we have many many FPGAs, uh, we of course, for us, we we, we build design with 20, 24 FPGAs. Uh, sometimes we need to use cables, and they become nightmare. The system become unstable, become slow, and so on. So, and but 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 fortunately today, um, the all the the, the, the latest FPGA Zilinx Altera, they support very good LVDS. They run at one gigahertz or more, and we can easily use the uh, LVDS signals to do pin multiplexing, and we can solve those issues. So, so, so that's that's my second point. Why is uh, partition is actually easier than before? And third point, of course, uh, today I think the t partition tool is not is nothing new. It has been out for a long time, and I'm I'm glad to say the quality of partition tool has improved uh, mo multiple times. And uh, S2C we have our own partition tool as well as we um, we support all the uh, the third party uh, partitioning tool. So I'm I'm, I'm just um, so my second point here is that don't be afraid afraid of uh, design partitioning. All right, so the third point I'm going to talk about is actually uh, that's which, when can I start FPGA prototyping? Uh, as, as, you, um, as, as you can see on the, on the chart, most of, most of the time we start design from a single block, and the, the whole design maybe um, consists of blocks designing by some other team, or, can, or maybe IP block from some other place. And then often you cannot do prototyping until you have all the blocks, and you have to wait. And then uh, so the usage of FPGA prototyping platform becomes um, very short. The, the, the time is very limited. So, so, so that's, let us look at also another different different view. Um, um, or if, for example, uh, in order to to do a complete testing, usually you, you, uh, our design consists of some kind of processor such as ARM a bus such as AXI, and then, and then uh, the part of design that we created, maybe slave and master and so on, we need to uh, compile the whole design, synthesize, place and row, and, dump, um, and then uh, of course download it into the FPGA, and at the same time, then we compile our C code, and then and load it into the memory, and start running on the platform. And of course, everyone knows this might take weeks, and sometimes if you're not careful, it might take them months. So how can we, um, is this the only way to do it? And for, fortunately, I think today there, I think there are multiple um, also uh, other vendors talking about hybrid prototyping, virtual prototyping, and so on. 
So um, a, a very good way, of course, is to use uh, a link to uh, simulation and through, of course, through a transaction-based um, um, approach so we can get high, high performance out of it. Uh, for example, here, uh, we, we, can, uh, we put an AXI bridge uh, compiled together with your design, put that into the prototyping platform, and on, on, the, uh, in, on, on the computer side, we have the APIs uh, such as uh, uh, read and write, it can be DNA, it can be interrupt and so on, and then you can just compile your code with the API and start running. And that, that means that you don't have to wait until your whole design is ready to start doing prototyping. And there are many benefits of, of doing this. First of all, uh, when, when you do prototype, some of your models might still be in, uh, in, your, in your software, and you can, you can utilize your, software, uh, your simulation models, your software models, to co-model with, uh, with, your, with your prototyping. And, and then second benefit, I think we talked about also someone mentioned earlier this morning, uh, most of the time prototyping are very, very only for, I think it's an unconstrained uh, testing, meaning that it's very hard to constrain random stuff in the prototyping. So in this case, we have many customers telling us that, yeah, prototyping is great and it has a speed, but at the end of the day, I, I want to make sure I run all my cases. Can I do that? So I think this approach allow them to enjoy both, both of the world so they can do both constraint and unconstrained testings. And there are also many other benefits such as you can, you can uh, create a design and start um, slowly moving block by block, block by block to the prototyping. So when you, your whole design is in the APGA, you know for sure that the whole design is working. You don't have to wait until everything is in the prototyping, then start doing the final uh, debug. All right, so, and then the fourth point is about debug. Uh, yes, uh, debug can be difficult. I think that's also an, an, another big challenge. Um, of course, you, um, the, the number one challenge is that uh, most tools today only support single FPGA. So if you have a design for FPGA, for example, here, you're usually looking at one waveform at a time and trying to correlate the four waveform to get some meaning out of the, the waveforms. And on top of that, um, um, most of the tools use uh, gate level names. So it's very difficult. Uh, not only difficult, sometimes the, names, uh, the, 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 the probes you're trying to see might get synthesized the way or optimized out. And that's very difficult to do. And then the, 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 uh, on top of that, uh, most of the tools use the internal memories of the APGA to store waveforms. So that means you have limited amount of uh, trace steps that you can see and maybe um, it's just not enough to, to, to get to the points you want to see. And then also, you're, you'll be fighting the memory space with your design. So, um, um, so I, the, 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 a good solution, of course, the answer is to use, uh, uh, um, we need to somehow get a whole, the whole um, four, uh, multiple APGA waveform into one place and also provide external storage. So deep Deep trace storage is very important because uh, uh, I think as we mentioned for APGA prototyping, I think the most critical part is to find those um, very very difficult to find bugs, and they are usually needs a lot and a lot of cycles to 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 uh, to appear. So you, if we only if we only have very short amount of, of trace trace depths, um, very likely you would not be able to catch those bugs. So I think the number one uh, the the number one point for uh, debugging is, uh, is the trace depth and also multi APGA. Okay, so then, and, and to my to my last point is uh, this point. The last point is uh, think big, and it's uh, think um, remote and uh, large deployment. Uh, many, many 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 times, most uh, prototyping uh, uh, when we start prototyping, we only think about doing hardware verifications. And then, uh, but in, in reality, when, when that's working, most likely you'll be deploying at multiple locations, multiple, lots of software guys, and sometimes they are even at um, different countries, different um, companies. And then having a, a, a way to manage this is very important. I think there are two very important uh, uh, pro three, two problems here. First problem is that to, to make sure that all the revisions out there 
Donald Deep Wire, which, which, one, which one is having problem, we need to give them a, a, a new firmware and so on. It's very difficult to track. And, and, and second reason, I think I hope there's no software guys here. Software guys are hardware dummies. So usually we don't want the software guys to touch the hardware. So, uh, so if we can virtualize anything we can, uh, I think we should do that. Okay. So the solution, I think I'm running out of time. So the solution is that we need some kind of advanced capability to put this uh, with uh, everything needs to be run on remote management. And then not only that, it has to be client-server based and also web-based interface with all the features listed here. I think they are all listed in, 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 your, in your slide. So I think I want to conclude that this is just a, the, the quick summary of the five points that make it a little bit different from, from the slides I have. But I think I hope this is just interesting enough for you to think, be thinking about APJ prototyping platform. So just the last slide of uh, advertising about S2C, uh, we founded in uh, 2003 in, in California, San Jose, California, being a 12 year company with 60 people, very dedicated doing APJ prototyping, solving the issues such as the issues that I just addressed about. Uh, about. If you guys are interested, please uh, find me talking uh, outside or look at our website. Thank you very much. Thank you.